thunderclouds sweep over tropical northwestern Australia, a land of just two seasons, the wet and the dry. They herald the wet and a resurgence of life. The wet is part of a weather giant, a creation of the mountains, rainforests, deserts and oceans of Asia and Australia. The search to fathom its mysteries matters nothing to the animals of this rich wilderness. What matters to them is that it exists, for to them, the monsoon means life. The start of the dry, and the sun rises over a billabong in northwestern Australia. Each year, the monsoon rains dictate the rhythm of life in this wilderness, a monsoon that swings with the sun between tropical Australia and Asia. The monsoon is now in Asia. While it's there, for six months, dry winds will blow from Australia's deserts and strip this land of water. On the plain where the billabong lies, a pair of jabiru storks have their nest. The nest has no protection against sun or drying wind, but salvation comes in an ingenious shape. A shower of billabong water, and the nest will not dry out or overheat. The first hatchling died, and its mother is eating it, a rather macabre action that she probably takes to recycle valuable nutrients in its tiny body. Her second chick is just beginning to hatch. This chick will have the luxury of its parents' undivided attention. The rains of the monsoon shape the floodplains, woodlands and rugged escarpments of the Kimberley and the top end of Australia. But the monsoon also pushes much further, far south, to where the desert sands meet the bright sea. A Gould's goanna ekes out a living along the shore, scavenging morsels thrown up by the sea. Competing with ants for whatever lies dead and shriveled by sun and wind. Yet here, on these dry shores, fresh water hides beneath the sands. But these kangaroos are able to unearth it. They reach it by digging wells, sometimes a metre deep. If there were no monsoon showers, there'd be no underground water for the roos to drink. Offshore, a unique and powerful current, the Lewin, is now flowing and wrapping the west coast in a blanket of warm equatorial water. During the dry season, the current streams from the Pacific into the Indian Ocean, pouring out of a giant pool of sun-warmed water around Indonesia, one of the biggest climate engines in the world. 
This engine releases some of its heat energy through the Lewin current, and its warm flow triggers a surge of life. About a week from the first full moon, after the current begins its flow, the corals of Western Australia start spawning. The arrival of the warm tropical water is the signal for which they've been waiting. Packets of coral eggs and drifts of sperm float through the waters to mingle and move south on the Lewin, bringing new life. of sea worms also set their reproductive clock to the Lewin current's rhythmic annual flow. Adults cast eggs and sperm adrift as self-propelled sexual segments which merge above the reef. to a silent beat, bridal veil jellyfish ride south on this conveyor belt of warm equatorial water. Tentacles meters long clasp microscopic prey to a hungry heart. From the smallest to the largest, fish hasten to the Lewin's feast. Intercepted on their seasonal migration from estuary to open sea, a school of Australian anchovies swim in tight, defensive formation. Giant whale sharks, surrounded by shoals of small acolytes, glide effortlessly southwards on the current, engulfing tiny fish and plankton. The whale sharks that visit Australia's west coast may have travelled a highway of ocean currents all the way from the Philippines. The Lewin is part of the monsoon that swings with the sun between tropical Australia and Asia. Southeast winds are the dry breath of southern deserts, and as they flow northwards out of Australia, these constant winds push the monsoon into Asia. The dry season is well advanced, and for three months, no rain has come to top up this billabong. These crocodiles can no longer immerse themselves and risk heat stress and dehydration, even sunburn. But falling water levels make it easy to fish, 
and the Jabiru parents airlift dozens a day to their fast-growing, lively chick. The chick is perpetually hungry and thirsty. It's now the cool part of the tropical year, but that's all relative. It's still close to 30 centigrade. Southeast winds gradually make the northern plains seem as parched and dusty as the deserts which spawn them. And life is becoming a daily trial. The grasses that sustain agile wallabies have withered and died. they are forced to resort to bulbs and roots. A spinifex pigeon and his mate find plentiful seed scattered among the grass clumps. But they must have water to help digest the seed. Little by little, water holes are shrinking and disappearing. Those that are left are becoming crowded. Nervously, a thirsty dragon lizard dashes a quick drink. As the sun moves south of the equator in October, the oldest of Australia's landscapes is relentlessly hot. An oven that the sun will fire up still further in coming months. Only hot air moves in this inferno. But even in the fiery Pilbara, there are animals. They're just out of sight, keeping still, trying to avoid the savage sun. Hold up in a cave, a euro finds shade. But a male ring-tailed dragon is on the horns of a dilemma. To stay out in the sun and get fried, or to stay in the shade and leave his territory open to invasion. He opts for a compromise. A quick sortie to the lookout point, toes raised to stop them burning on the hot rock, and then a quick dash for shade. On the exposed plains, a red kangaroo tries to keep cool. Just a few centimetres down, the soil doesn't burn as much. And licking a forelimb is rather like sweating. As her saliva evaporates in the heat, it cools her. The plains are covered in tinder dry grass.
From Australia's red heart to the west coast, hot air is rising. As it does so, it leaves a void, which something must fill. And the something is moisture-laden air, sucked down from the equator. An airflow that will eventually bring monsoon rain. Far from Australia, the mighty peaks of the Himalayas are the monsoon's northern frontier. And here, the monsoon is coming to an end as the seasons change in the northern hemisphere. As the sun moves away south, cold, dry air begins to mass over the Himalayas and Tibetan Plateau. It falls off the mountains and streams southwards, a chill wind that sends prayers painted on cloth flags to the sky and that pushes the monsoon south, just as Australia's desert winds pushed it north nearly six months ago. The seasonal change that will carry the monsoon to Australia signals a general downhill retreat. Tibetan snowcocks descend with the cold, flocking in large numbers to feed at lower altitude. From every peak and crag, cold air pours downwards, southwards, as the winds gather strength and momentum. People too increasingly feel the cold breath of the Himalayas and pack up and leave for warmer ground. Yak herders spend the monsoon summer months high in the mountains. As the cold bites more deeply, they descend, before snow covers the upper passes in a deep, wintry blanket. Kathmandu Valley, Hindus celebrate the awakening of the god Vishnu. This holy festival marks the beginning of the post-monsoon harvest under the mighty peaks. Recently, an astonishing link was found between these great mountains and distant tropical Australia. Monsoon rains there are stronger when Himalayan winter snows are heavy. As it journeys south, the monsoon is revitalised and strengthened by moisture that streams off the equatorial rainforests of Southeast Asia. Indeed, much of the rain taken up by the monsoon originates here, where the climate is virtually a year-round constant. Hot, wet and suffocatingly humid. Orangutans lead mostly solitary lives in the rainforests of Sumatra. The stable climactic conditions of these forests mean there's always something to eat. Breeding is not dictated by one annual period of food plenty. Female orangutans give birth at any time of year and a single slow-growing youngster receives a huge amount of maternal time and energy. Animals that live with an annual cycle of wet and dry 
don't have this luxury. In the tropics, moisture constantly circulates between land, sea and air. What goes up as evaporation eventually comes down again as rain. And some of the moisture, sweated upwards by this lush steam bath, fuels the monsoon. By November, seasonal Indian ocean currents have blocked the westward flow of water, and it's now trapped in the giant Indonesian warm pool, heating steadily under the tropical sun. Moisture streams upward from the surface, turning to cloud, which is pushed south by the cold airflow from the Tibetan plateau. These waders were massed far away in Asia, waiting for the winds to carry them south on a five-day flight to Australia. Their arrival is the first visible sign of change. The dry will soon be over. But their journey isn't. This was just a staging post. They must now fly to summer feeding grounds down on the southern tip of Australia. The winds that brought the birds carry a tantalizing promise of rain. They also bring moist air and humidity sores, making this a furnace and a steam bath. Waiting for the monsoon is hell. The animals of the Northwest are now serving time in a harsh prison, governed by a pitiless sun. The billabong is setting like concrete the crocodile has nowhere to hide. A water-dwelling file snake is within days of gasping its last. If the rains don't come soon, mud will be its tomb. The crocodile's life, too, hangs by a thread. His heart beats twice a minute. He breathes just once an hour. His head is buried in a desperate attempt to keep it cool. Heat radiates off the baking escarpment. Moist air is being pulled south from equatorial seas. Hot updrafts lift it, turning it into cloud. The first localized storms are about to break. Creeks flow as if they'd never run dry. The rainbow pitter changes suddenly from shy recluse to noisy bird of action.
males swiftly set up territories, find mates, and throw up bulky, waterproof nests. It'll soon be raining in earnest. A pair of orange-footed scrub fowl have leapt into action, adjusting their huge nest mound, a sort of compost heap, which stews and heats up when warmth, water and microbes get together. A surrogate parent, perfect for incubating buried eggs. Invertebrates survived the dry months deep underground. The rains have brought them up to feed at the moist surface. Snails and worms fall straight into the clutches of pitters, now out collecting chick food. These first rains are loaded with nitrogen, fixed in a chemical reaction between air, water and lightning, and dumped on the landscape like tons of the best garden fertiliser. The nitrogen-rich new growth is the year's best grazing. Wallabies rapidly regain lost weight. The monsoon isn't just six months of solid rain. It comes and goes in waves or troughs. At first, it's gentle with localised storms. Later, more persistent rain will fall. And out at sea, the first trough is growing. The first rains were enough to rescue the crocodile. He's afloat again, back in business and into the fray, facing up to those who'd steal his billabong territory, if they could. A smaller male would back off. One of equal size won't. The territory holder must hang on to his piece of real estate to be able to attract females and breed. Competition between males is about the right to procreate, and that's worth fighting for. The trough that was forming has come ashore. bringing strong northwesterly winds with it. Previous rains have soaked the soil and cicadas have emerged to call for mates under the relative shelter of branches. If you're a tawny frogmouth who can't hide under a branch, 
You have a right to look miserable. It's rained without a break for days. Rivers flow strongly again for the first time in six months. For about five weeks now, erratic storms and showers take the place of monsoon troughs, and the animals take advantage of the brief lull between the year's big monsoon rain events. This stretch of stream is the home range of a Merton's water monitor, a big lizard equally at home on land as in water, that switches diet between dry and wet. Fresh fish are now on the menu. Its tail is different from other monitor lizards, flattened, paddle-like, the propeller that drives its metre-long body. rainbow fish swim too fast for the water monitor. It targets slow-moving purple-spotted gudgeon, hiding under ledges. Local showers and storms maintain the water levels of streams and billabongs. The saltwater crocodile has secured his territory. He's attracted a female and is trying to impress her with his size and strength. Their courtship is peppered with bubbles, rumbles and splashes. He's at least twice her length and four times heavier, but still he pushes her around delicately and with care. She'll respond fearlessly and aggressively if he doesn't match up. His mixed display lures the females and repels rivals. The Jabiru chick has fledged and with its parents is hunting Long Tom, a type of garfish, quickly dispatched and swallowed. Other river animals present a real puzzle. A baby northern long-necked turtle comes protected by hard shell.
This stalk hasn't learned that you can just swallow them whole and let digestive juices do the rest. As the waters spread, spangled grunters turn nomad, journeying to colonize new watercourses. The grunters need to rush the shallows, dangerous bottlenecks where whiskered terns pounce. Freshwater crabs tidy up. The calm between the monsoon troughs is about to end. As if sensing a drop in air pressure, the whiskered terns fly to take cover in the mangroves. The mightier second monsoon trough arrives with a spectacular flourish. This much deeper trough hits northwestern Australia in late February. Its rains will be the most torrential of the year, falling almost constantly for weeks. Drenched magpie geese wait for the water level to rise and the wild rice to flower and seed. Then they can nest and raise their young. A tough-skinned crocodile is impervious to heavy rain, but his familiar territorial boundaries are starting to disappear as the water rises. Agile wallabies now start edging off the plains to higher ground. It's as if they had a sixth sense of what is about to happen. By mid-March, every last square metre of sandstone escarpment is saturated. It can hold no more and water erupts.
rivers have risen high over their banks and add their rapid flow to the inundated surroundings. A flycatcher made a sad choice of a nest site. It was originally high on a bank. The chick and eggs have little chance. A plains monitor, exiled from its burrow by rising water. A reptile not designed to swim like its paddle-tailed cousin. The top of a tree, standing metres deep in water, is a life raft. Each tree is crowned with the homeless. Grasshoppers by the score, a waterlogged dusky rat. The whiskered terns at roost in the mangroves will feast on the luckless grasshoppers. They've had to switch diet. Ever since the fish spread out, they've become too difficult to catch. The monsoon trough moves south, leaving an impressive mark. The dusky rat has had to abandon his perch and look for another. The rains may have gone, but the waters haven't stopped rising yet. The wet season is hard on these native animals. Death waits in the deep flowing water below and in the leafy outposts. However, this particular water python has already stuffed himself with castaways. His only problem is keeping warm in order to digest all the free meals, which include animals used to water, but not this much. All manner of castaways cling desperately to anything that rears above the water, some can survive without a daily meal, but the planigale cannot. Australia's smallest carnivore is incredibly aggressive, willing to devour prey its own size. Plains monitor can fast for several weeks and survive, which is just as well. It may not be able to return to the burrow dug by these claws for six weeks. Plenty of time for its bite to heal. Mineral rich silt from the escarpment washes down over the plains an injection of nutrients to invigorate them when the waters finally recede. In some places, the river is 20 kilometers wide. Crocodiles and fish now spread out in a mass migration. But for others, it's a time to get out of the water onto dry land, if they can. If it rains more than usual, life on the riverbank can lose its appeal. Having dumped much of its rain, the monsoon continues south, drawn down to the void over the deserts left by rising hot air. its journey's end. This is where the monsoon sheds its last dying showers. But as it expires, the monsoon cools the air, kills the hot updrafts, and finally puts out the fire that drew it here.
Several months later, the desert is a place transformed. Honeyeaters arrive from the south to drink the huge nectar crop from flowers like Sturt's desert pea. Millions of grasshoppers have hatched. This generation will leave their legacy as eggs buried in the sand, ready to hatch when a new monsoon arrives next year. The monsoon is now gathering strength for its journey back to the Himalayas. Though thousands of kilometres apart, the fiery Australian deserts and these great icy peaks share the same monsoon system. The link between Himalayan snows and Australian monsoon rain ties these two great continents together. Equatorial rainforests constantly feed heat and moisture into the monsoon, as does the vast Indonesian warm pool that surrounds these islands. This much of the system is known. But a new element has just entered the equation. Indian Ocean warm and cold eddies, first seen from space, hundreds of kilometres in extent. Their role is still a mystery. The animals of Australia's tropical northwest have, of course, no understanding of such things. Nor of our quest to penetrate the monsoon's deeper mysteries. Only the fact of its existence concerns them. The rhythm of their lives moves to its regular beat, and the waters it brings are a matter of life itself. <laughs> 